Okay, this video is a book review. The name of the book is right here, Sculptor and Destroyer, The Tales of Glutamate, The Brain's Most Important Neurotransmitter. The author is Mark Matson. This is a picture of Mark Matson right here. Um, this is just a picture. He's included in this particular picture with Rhonda Patrick. She gives a lot of videos about physiology. She's okay, but she's part of that high fat crowd, part of that you know, what seems to me a bit of a commercial promotion of high fat things and other trendy gimmicks. Okay, uh, so what was good about the book? Well, this guy, Mark Matson is a real scientist. He's worked for decades and decades with this neurotransmitter glutamate. So he gave a nice summary of all the history of glutamate research. I thought that was good. But, you know, there's another sayer uh, saying, somebody describes scientists as most scientists are bricklayers and you know workers they're, they're 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 carpenters they're not architects they don't they're not able to build systems and really change paradigms so that was what i thought was weak about the book he doesn't really change anything okay he spent most of his life trying to come up with a way to treat acute strokes for example you can inhibit glutamate receptors and then decrease the damage to the surrounding tissues, the penumbra, after a stroke. And it works well in animals, but not in humans, because human strokes are too unpredictable. How big the stroke is when the patient comes into the hospital, their comorbidities, etc. Okay, some good basic points that he makes. Glutamate is over 90% of brain neurotransmitters. I had read other things that thought it was less, so you know he's pretty definitive on that subject. Over 90% of neurons in the brain, their neurotransmitter is glutamate. So that's pretty important. Um, glutamate is basically the on switch for neurons. When glutamate system comes on, you get increased calcium in the cytoplasm and something happens in the neuron. Uh, the inhibitory neurotransmitter is GABA. And in the cerebral cortex, it's all glutamate and GABA for the most part. The popular press neurotransmitters we hear about all the time are things like you know, serotonin, 5-HT, uh, norepinephrine, acetylcholine, and dopamine, and there's a few other minor neurotransmitters. But these are all very small in their percentage of uh, neuronal synapses. Okay, um, You could think of them as like dimmer switches. So glutamate is the on switch, GABA is the off switch, and these are modulators or dimmer switches. Um, the brain has about 100 billion neurons. That's a lot, 100 billion, B as in billion and about 100 trillion synapses, meaning connections between neurons. This is another reason why I believe in God. It's way, 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 way too complicated. It just happened by chance. It's incredible, the complexity of it all. Um, it's routine for a neuron to be connected to over 1,000 neurons. Okay, um, Substantia nigra dopamine neuron, the ones that are damaged with Parkinson's disease, they'll routinely have over 300,000 synapses. So what I'm trying to say is, you look at these psychiatric medications, they'll draw you a picture of one neuron interacting with one synapse. And that's good for having a beginning understanding and for teaching, but that's not realistic for what the brain's really like. So that's why I, I'm not a believer at all in psychiatric medicines, because it's just too complicated. And good luck changing one thing and not having a whole bunch of other things affected by that. Okay, as you know, Bregan said that he says, you know, all these psych meds, virtually all of them, Grace Jackson, another psychiatrist says, you know, they all end up being chemical lobotomies, gradual chemical lobotomies. Okay, um, he describes typical neuron resting potential as negative 70 millivolts. A lot of them teach that. I kind of like the idea of negative 65, 66 in the sense that that's about how much ATP energy is used for ion pumps. He'll say in some neurons it's only as little as 50%. So, when I come up with a number, a lot of times what I'm really trying to work with is a concept. So the idea of two-thirds of the ATP going for the pump and it being about you know, negative 66 or negative 65, that's easy to remember. And the concept is the important thing to remember uh, when, you're, when you're talking about neurophysiology, trying to make sense of everything. Um, a regular cell might only use about one-third of its ATP for its uh, plasma membrane ATP pumps like sodium potassium pumps. Okay, the glutamate, AMPA, and KNIC receptors, those are calcium, I'm sorry, those are sodium channels, sodium channels. The NMDA receptor is an ionotropic calcium channel, meaning that it's just the ion going through it. There's other types of channels called metabotropic. Those end up increasing cytoplasm calcium as well. Um, GABA neurotransmitter does the opposite. It sort of turns the cell off and it opens up calcium channels, which is a negative ion, anion, and that comes into the cell and it hyperpolarizes it, making its 
uh, plasma membrane voltage potential more negative. That makes it less excitable. It turns off the neuron. He says four things that improve neuron function, exercise, we'd expect that, intellectual challenges, intellectual conversations, and intermittent fasting. He's a big proponent of intermittent fasting. And there are some good things about intermittent fasting. It depends how you define it. You know, eating the OMAD diet, in a sense, is an intermittent fasting. You, you only eat once a day and you fast in between that. Um, this whole stuff about exercise really is, I think, a good example of use it or lose it. I've known guys that were college athletes who kept on training and competing in the senior divisions, and they're in incredibly good shape versus once you stop you know, an intense competitive sport like wrestling, it's hard to go back to it. Um, I went back to it to teach my nephew a bit when he was a high school wrestler, but, you know, it wasn't the same as when I was young. Um, exercise does lots of great things. I mean, I think the purpose of a brain to walk down a path in a forest or a jungle and survive. So you have to, for an animal, walking into an environment, you have to learn that environment very fast so you can survive in that environment. And all kinds of good things happen. Synaptogenesis, formation of new synapses between neurons, connections between neurons, neurogenesis, formation of entirely new neurons, mitochondrial biogenesis to make new mitochondria, angiogenesis to make new blood vessels to supply those new neurons, um, and the astrocytes will also store more glycogen. That's called glycogen supercompensation. So this is another reason why exercise is one of the best things you can do to age well because it Simultaneously, while you build your muscles and you build your muscle capacity, the mitochondria and the muscle, you also do something very similar in the brain. Um, adequate magnesium from eating plants, which is located in the center of magnesium in the center of the NMDA receptor, they call it MDAR, that will also help prevent hyperexcitability. It makes it work the way it's supposed to work. Oh, look at this. All the good stuff comes from plants. Dietary fiber helps uh, keep the blood-brain barrier intact so you don't get toxins in the brain. Potassium and, and nit nitric oxide coming from nitrates from greens are vasodilators that maintain adequate blood flow to the brain and protect it. Antioxidants coming from plant foods prevent oxidative stress, which can happen when you've got other problems like excessive iron overload, excessive EMF, and all that. Prefrontal cortex is the last part of the brain to be developed in the frontal lobes, and that's why young people do not have very good judgment. Um... The astrocytes, we know they remove glutamate from the synaptic cleft after it exerts its effect on the postsynaptic neuron. They also clear that out. They convert it to glutamine, cycle it back to the neuron. They also clear out uh, potassium from the cleft um, after an action potential event to help the uh, neuron to repolarize. Okay, uh, functional MRI research with all this stuff. It can now track regional blood flow. There's other things they can do. They even have a mechanism where well, they can detect... Uh, the changes in cytoplasm calcium concentration, which is super important, obviously. There was a big thing in 1987 when these algae in Canada, you know, in the water, uh, made domoic acid, which is an excitotoxin, and it got into, like, shellfish, and people ate it and became very sick because it couldn't be cleared well from the synapse. That's another reason why I'm not that excited about algae. I realized that was sort of like a red tide event or something like that. Um, and there were seabirds acting crazy after ingesting some of the stuff, and that was the idea for the movie The Birds with Alfred Hitchcock's involvement and whatnot. And so, like I said, you know, this guy was involved for decades working on studies to try to help treat stroke, and none of them really panned out too well. And so when I say somebody's like a great doctor, a great scientist, I mean somebody like, you know, the reason why I think McDougal's the best in nutrition docs because he'll take a subject – like everyone thinks, you know, coronary artery stents are so great. And he'll say, look, they're nonsense. They don't work. Okay. He can totally flip a paradigm backwards, turn it inside out and say, here's the reason it's wrong and back that up. That's brilliant scientific work. Douglas Callan, Etheresia Pretorius, their idea of finding amyloidogenic clotting. That's a big deal. That has a big effect on leaky gut, on autoimmune disease, on dementia, and on understanding infections. So that's big, big, big stuff. You know, Richard Moore turning around the paradigm uh, on understanding hypertension with his understanding of ion pumps, okay? His understanding of hypertension can be due not only to excess sodium, but due to a deficiency of potassium or magnesium. I mean, that's big, brilliant stuff. So the bottom line, Madsen, I, what I liked about him, he's honest, he tells the truth, he summarizes all his research, uh, what I thought was weak about him was he stays within established paradigms. He kind of went down the path of, 
you know, ketosis, liking that idea. I don't think he knows that much about nutrition. So I would say the book is decent if you're really, really interested in excitotoxicity like I am. Um, and he's got a lot of videos on the internet, but I think that he just played it safe. You know, when he's talking about autism, when he's talking about a whole bunch of things, he's always playing it safe. And, and the reason that these academic guys do that as well is because the way they're hoping to win the jackpot, to win the lottery for them, is to come up with a profitable drug. But the vast majority of drugs never work, and the vast majority of these guys dedicate their whole life trying to find a drug, and they never find anything. And the drugs that are found tend to be fakes and don't work. <clears throat> so be that as it may, I still enjoyed the book, but I, I would not say this is something that anyone would want to read unless they were very much interested in glutamate neurotransmission and excitotoxicity. So anyways, there it is.